Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. We are Donna Luella Mahana. We founded Integrity Counseling in 2014 as a volunteer organization dedicated to making a difference in our community for those who can't afford traditional avenues of counseling. Let's see how I can do this. Oh, there it is. All right. Um, today, our focus is everyone needs an advocate. We have learned over time that those with physical and mental health, um, health concerns often need support in their journey towards healing. Today, we're going to cover four things. What does it mean to be an advocate? We'll share a personal story. We will share ideas about how you, too, can be an advocate. And we will share how this applies to integrity counseling. Rosalind Carter once said, there are four kinds of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. I like this quote because I have my own favorite saying, which is everyone needs an advocate. Sooner or later, we will all face a personal situation that will require someone to go to bat for us. It may be related to an employment issue, a legal issue, or a health issue. If it's a health issue, it could be a matter of life or death. We or a loved one could be suffering from a, a disease that is easily recognizable, such as diabetes, cancer, or um, heart disease. Or our illness could be a mental health issue, which could be much harder to recognize. Today, we want to focus on being an advocate for yourself or someone else in the area of mental health. I became very familiar with the concept of being an advocate when I worked as a volunteer counselor at Home Sweet Home Ministries. Well, there I saw a huge gap in affordable, accessible uh, count, uh, mental health uh, services. Uh, I also became the counselor of a woman with severe bipolar disorder, anxiety, and paranoia. On her exterior, she was hard and she was perceived as mean. This woman had suffered trauma and loss and her rough edge was her way of protecting herself. When this woman came to me, she struggled to open up, but eventually she did because as she said, she saw Christ in me and that was important to her. She painfully shared how she would never talk to her family again, yet she talked about her adult children and her grandchildren almost all the time. The two of us connected, and I became not only her mental health advocate, but also her physical relationship and spiritual advocate as well. After she moved out of the shelter into her own apartment, I advocated that I continue seeing her even though she was no longer a resident. I also advocated for a, an appropriate wraparound uh, plan, which involved getting her connected to a local church. That was something she really longed to do, which she was afraid of doing on her own. I attended psychiatric appointments with her um, because she was paranoid and she was afraid that her uh, psychiatrist was gonna dismiss her. Um, and when it was obvious that she was physically unwell, I went together, I took her to some um, appointments Together, we actually fired uh, one doctor who was not treating her with the care and compassion that she deserved. Eventually, when she found out that she did have cancer, she acted bravely and reunite, reunited with her adult children and grandchildren. The birdcage in this photo was a gift from her when, when we opened Integrity Counseling. When she gave this to me, she pointed out that the bird was on the outside of the cage. To her, our time together had freed her to be able to reconnect with her family and live again. Her work in therapy had revealed the person trapped beneath the problems, difficulties, and behaviors. Sadly, in 2015, she passed away from cancer, but she had healed in so many other ways. Not everyone's story is as difficult as hers, but there are many around us who need help on this journey to wholeness. 
that process is often about finding themselves and becoming who they are deep within. Clearly not all of us are counselors, so what are some things that you can do to advocate for yourself and others? So in order to advocate for the mental health of others, the first step is to bust some common myths. One myth is that personal weakness or character flaws cause mental health problems. The fact is that mental health problems have nothing to do with being lazy or weak, and many people need help to get better. Many factors contribute, including life experiences such as trauma or a history of abuse, biological factors such as genes, physical illness, injury or brain chemistry. Another myth is the belief that I can't do anything for a person with mental illness. The fact is that friends and loved ones can make a big difference. Only 44% of adults with diagnosable <laughs> mental health problems and less than 20% of youth receive the needed treatment. To help, you can reach out and be available to talk and support. You can help them find access to mental health services. You can learn and share facts about mental health, especially if you hear something that isn't right. And you can treat them with the respect and dignity just as you would anyone else. Perhaps the most helpful thing you can do is to be open to listening and ready to have what can be difficult conversations. One of the most common problems is a feeling of isolation. The misperception is my problems are unique and no one else is experiencing them. Unhealthy thoughts can cause shame and concern, adding to the sense of isolation. If you can be a non-judgmental listening ear, it may be possible for people to talk, to really talk, and see the need for help and look to make positive change. Knowing that someone else cares matters tremendously. Sometimes people who are suffering from a mental health condition don't recognize the symptoms. Here are five signs that someone may need help. Their personality changes. You may notice sudden or gradual changes. They may behave in ways that don't fit, the, uh, don't fit their values or they just may seem different. They may, they may be overly anxious, agitated, or moody. They may have problems controlling their temper. Um, and even in some more extreme situations, they may explode at a minor problem. They may withdraw or isolate. Someone who used to be socially engaged may pull away and stop taking part in what they used to enjoy. You may notice a change in the level of personal care or poor judgment and self-destructive behavior. They may feel hopeless and overwhelmed. If they express what seems to lead towards self-harm, <laughs> Uh, you might want to call the new 988 crisis line. We have flyers on the suicide and crisis line out in the uh, exit on the round table on your way out. One of the best ways you, you can, I'm sorry, one of the best ways to build your knowledge is to take a mental health first aid training. These are, off, these are offered in our community on a periodic basis and can be specialized to youth, adult, and older adults. These classes are coordinated by the McLean County Health Department. You are more likely to encounter someone in a mental or emotional crisis than someone having a heart attack. Mental Health First Aid teaches you how to identify, understand, and respond to the signs of mental illness and substance use disorders. This training gives you the skills you need to reach out and provide initial support to someone who may be developing a mental health or substance use problem and help connect them to the right sources. We have uh, flyers on mental health first aid out in the uh, area as well. We have talked about advocacy, shared personal story, and giving you some ideas about what you can do. How does this relate to integrity? When we draw back and look at our community, McLean County has challenges that are typical <laughs> across the nation. Many people feel that their mental health isn't what it should be. Too many youth are struggling, and one suicide is too many. And for those who also struggle to make ends meet, the challenge is even more difficult. 
While McLean County has made steady progress in improving services, the need is still bigger than the available resources. We see the opportunity to work towards our vision of stigma-free mental health support for all. In 2014, we started Integrity Counseling. For each of the last two community health improvement plans, the number one priority has been behavioral health, and the second was access to care. Integrity was designed to directly address both priorities. Too many in our community don't have insurance, can't use what they have, and can't afford the copay or deductibles. They often choose between counseling and groceries. We saw stigma attached to mental illness that caused people to be reluctant to seek help. We saw disparity in access for racial, language, and economic reasons. And we saw a lack of understanding about mental health and the resources available to people. So we sought to pull together like-minded people to volunteer to help. We worked to provide counseling, education, and outreach to make a difference in our clients' lives, those around them, and the community at large. Our clients are a kaleidoscope of ages and lifestyles, ethnicities and cultures, traumas and troubles, children and youth, the elderly and couples, families in crisis, and school children struggling to fit in and work through their traumas. Mothers and fathers trying to improve themselves for their families. Each one has a unique story. Each one needs to be met where they are to move forward. We work to advocate for them as unique individuals. Our motto of Do Be Heals takes them on a journey of doing to become who they are to move towards healing. Do be healed. We have a team of advocates uh, within Integrity. We are a diverse team of dedicated people. Over the last year, 88 people participated at Integrity in one way or another. We had over 30 people offer services as counselors or social workers. About 50 helped us at the front desk and the rest were either on our board or people who offered their time to support us in the community or even clean the office on weekends. Integrity has become a place that people come to to complete their master's programs in counseling or social work. We've also had psychiatric nurse practitioners complete their clinical hours with us. Bachelor's candidates in psychology, social work, and communication have interned, and many college students have volunteered with us. We started small and have grown tremendously over eight years. We get referrals from the hospitals, doctors, social service agencies, and by word of mouth. We actually have a standing appointment on Wednesdays for hospital discharges. We use an electronic medical record system with online forms and video telehealth for individuals and groups. We added Spanish language to our systems and trained ISU students and community members to serve as translators. We are supported by client contributions as they are able, donations and private grants. In partnership with our supporters, we completed nearly 4,000 appointments last year alone. Recently, our board decided to expand our space with a conference center that became available right next door to our office when the former tenants decided to move. Previously, we were only able to borrow this space occasionally, but we had good success with it. Having control of the space changes the game entirely. This gives us the chance to expand our education and outreach and have new opportunities for our volunteers to advocate with a range of supports for youth, parents, and specific groups to build skills for more successful living. I have, we didn't put this in the script, but we have a Seven Habits class coming up in September, so you might want to think about joining that. So how can you help Integrity? We are always looking for more people to join us. We need front desk volunteers to do a couple of hours a week. We're looking for more qualified counselors and clinical supervisors. You may have a skill that our clients or the public may benefit from. You could share that in small groups, 
or teach a class. We are looking for people to join our fundraising team as well. You can share our story with others who might become clients or who may become providers. Often we find that there's kind of the seven degrees of separation. If you talk to one person, you find out the third person to talk to is the person that needed to come to us. And of course, we welcome, uh, oh, I'm sorry. You're also invited uh, to see us and see our facility uh, to give a feel for what we do. And of course, we welcome financial gifts to keep doing our work. Luella and I have volunteered our time to run Integrity for the last eight years. This Sunday, we will celebrate the first birthday of our first grandchild. Together with our board, we are working to secure the limited staff needed to support our volunteers and meet client needs beyond our full-time involvement. It'll take a few years, but we are confident that our team will help us get there. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. We hope you've learned a bit about how everyone needs an advocate, how to be part of the solution, and how Integrity is working to advocate for those who need us. As we're preparing for today, and in fact, this morning in your, in your, your talk, um, we were struck by how closely our work aligns with Rotary's motto, service above self. Truly, our world is made better when we give ourselves to others. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. <clears throat> You're speechless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yes. Um, so, where are we? My question is, where are you located? We're at 502 South Morris. We're on the west side of Bloomington by purpose. So, what's the waiting time to get in on the call today? Uh, typically, it takes about a, a week or so to schedule a intake appointment. Our process is we do an intake appointment, and then after we do the intake appointment, we know what they need. And then we work with our network of volunteers to schedule someone. So from the first call, two to three weeks. One of the things we um, didn't mention also is that since we don't take insurance, if somebody calls and they do have both a good income and insurance, we refer them on. So what we say is that we serve the uninsured and the underinsured. Yes. Can you tell me if there's a meaning to the upper and lowercase letters in your logo? Yes, sure can. Uh, can we put that back up? Is that possible? Put this presentation back up for us. Uh, integrity is built off Luella and I, and uh, we we are people of faith. And INRI is actually the letters above the cross: Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Uh, the, the the fish was actually drawn by my father uh, before he died in 1986 for a business that he had, and that's obviously a Christian symbol. And then do be healed, DBH, was Luella's dad, Darrell B. Harrison, who was a pastor. So our nonprofit is our faith in our fathers uh, in expression. Yes? I apologize if I missed this, but how exactly are you funded? Uh, well, uh, that uh, I'll... How we're funded is that uh, we depend on client contributions, so we ask the clients to participate, and sometimes that's change, sometimes that's a check, and that ends up being about 25% uh, of our current operating expenses, and then the rest of it comes from donations and private grants. Uh, we received uh, help from the Scott Health Foundation a couple of times. Uh, we've had a few grants from some churches, uh, but most of it actually is individual donors, uh, supporting what we do. I don't know. Joni has her hand up online. I don't know if she would like to speak. She went away. <laughs> okay. Forget it. Okay. Well, we appreciate your Good morning. attention today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.